very good morning however modern however advanced we may have become however much influences of the western culture may have come into us in certain ways we still continue to be very traditional very orthodox and this is mostly seen when it comes to relationships even today it is considered to be uh, you know a wrong thing to do if an elder walks into the room and if you don't get up to greet him it is considered bad to use any slang or any you know uh, language which is not appropriate when you are talking to people who are elder than you or more respectable than you or whatever we still have this culture of how to treat women you should see how much it happens in the military you know even a general jumps and gets up if a lieutenant's wife walks in to the uh, room so these are all the traditions and all these things that we have carried on which is excellent which is really very good and i admire and i appreciate uh, uh, it but today why i brought up this particular topic was because i wanted to understand that we have to draw lines somewhere or the other just because we talk about tradition we talk about you know our culture and our so called morals it does not mean that we can allow people to ride roughshod over us you remember i had mentioned i will never forget that uh, you know youngster when we had this uh, seminar on uh, adolescence and i had brought these three four teenagers to come on to the stage and uh, answer questions by the audience and there was this elderly gentleman who got up and said in very serious tone why is it that you youngsters do not give respect to your elders and this 17 year old boy with such a disarming smile he said sir i don't see any reason why i should give respect to somebody just because incidentally he was born before me please give a thought this is where we are stuck we still think that i should get more respect just because i am elder than you whereas the world has changed so much that today experience has become a dirty word young people get employment like this middle aged people have to struggle to get an employment if they lose their job and elderly people don't get jobs at all so what is that an indication of it's an indication that times have changed and we need to change with the times and this age thing is only one of the factors that i'm talking about there are so many others which we come in i mentioned to you about gender for example on the one side women are saying we want equality we want this we want that women should be allowed to get into the military they should be able they should be given equal opportunities and stuff like that at the same time when it comes to certain things where you know you say something and you say how dare you talk to a woman like that if i crack a joke with a man it is acceptable if i crack a joke at the expense of a woman it is just not acceptable so why this uh, uh, thing because here very conveniently we are bringing in our tradition and cultures you cannot talk like this to so and so all these factors made me think of today's uh, topic at a practical level i'm not talking about you want to change the world and you can't you know negate traditions and cultures i don't want to also there's so much going for us in our traditions and cultures we should preserve it but what happens when as i said no at an individual level people tend to cross into our boundaries how do we at a practical level ensure that our boundaries are kept intact so we have this what we refer to as a intimate circle maybe my parents my spouse my child these are people who are so close to me that you know i consider them as intimate i allow them into my nearest 
and my innermost circle. Beyond that would be the extended social circle. Maybe my siblings, my cousins, my relatives, my good friends, all those. Beyond that is the social circle. So we have these different circles and we have certain boundaries. If my daughter, you know, misbehaves with me, I'll get angry, but I will forgive her. But if some unknown girl of the same age comes and misbehaves with me, I'm going to say, hey, who allowed you to do that? Who gives you the permission to act like this with uh, me? I will not allow her to get into that, uh, you know, the inner uh, circle, which I have reserved for somebody. But equally important is when we talk about even our innermost circle, when we talk about our intimate relationships, even there, there has to be a boundary. That is what many people do not realize. There is no such thing as unconditional love according to me. You may hate me for saying that. You may disagree. You may have a hundred logical reasons for saying it. But I always will stick to my ground at least so far till somebody convinces me otherwise that even when we love somebody immensely, it is not what we call as unconditional I have expectations. In fact, the closer the relationship, the higher is the expectation. I have more expectation from my nearest and dearer than I have from other people. So when I claim that this is unconditional love, why is it that I get so angry when somebody very close to me says something? If my spouse uh, you know, makes a nasty remark on uh, me, if my child uh, you know, makes a very impertinent remark against uh, me, why is it that I get so uh, angry? I'm supposed to be giving unconditional love. No? So let's be practical. The same way as there is no such thing as unconditional love, there should always be certain boundaries in our uh, uh, relationship. That is what I want us to you know, start working on. And at a practical level, in a few minutes, I'll give you some tips on how we can go about the um, thing. The one important thing before I come to that is to understand that we need to periodically review our most important relationships. At one time, they may be going in a particular way and I may be having certain uh, you know, ups and downs and certain ways I'm interacting, but it does not remain the same. Any close relationship is dynamic, it keeps changing and it has to be nurtured. And during this process of nurturing, during this process of realigning the relationships, questioning yourself and finding out what I can do to improve on it, from time to time I also need to see whether any of my relationships is crossing the boundaries. One of the most important thing in a close relationship is to give space, for example. Do I give space to somebody? Or do I feel that anything and everything has to be done only along with this person? I know of people who are so possessive of their near and dear that they want to ensure that they are with them all the time. But that's definitely not a good uh, uh, sign. You have to let go. You have to have space. A simple thing like, you know, taking time away from each other, whoever it may be. It may be a parent. It may be a spouse. It may be a child. Do you, you know, consciously make efforts to physical space to each other? If I'm living under the same roof, with some family member. Do I continue to live uh, in, under the same roof for 365 days a year? Can I not set aside three days or 13 days when we are not under the same roof? To get a feel of what it means to be away from each other. How do I feel about this person when this person is not there directly in my vicinity? There is so much we learn. Try it out next time and see. 
anybody with whom you have been spending all your time very close. And this can be extended beyond your immediate family also. So, a neighbor or a friend and you have this habit of meeting up every evening or going for a walk every morning or whatever. For a few days, take a holiday from that. Say that I've got some commitments and I've got some other things to do. So for the next X days, I will not be meeting you on a daily basis. And that helps you to introspect how this relationship has been going. What do I need to do to nurture it? Do I want to nurture it? Actually, that also is very important. Or is it getting a little too strenuous? Is it getting a little too overbearing on uh, uh, me? In which case you can extend that uh, you know, space and say, okay, for a month now I'm going to take off. As I said, because of our culture, because of our traditions, it is not considered to be a good thing. Supposing you're talking to a couple and you ask them that, uh, you know, where are you planning to go for your uh, holidays? And they say that the husband will be going to a hill station and the wife will be going to a beach. We are both of us going to enjoy our vacation and come back. As per our normal traditions, what will people think? This marriage is coming to an end. They can't even take vacations together. So what sort of a relationship is this? I think they are not getting along at all. I think this marriage is on the rocks. I tell you, it is exactly the reverse. For some reason, the husband likes to spend his vacation in the hills. And the wife likes to spend her vacation on the beach. What's wrong with it? Now, if you force yourself, you're unhappy. Even if you alternate that we'll spend X days on uh, the beach and Y days on the hills. Somehow both of them are left incomplete. But if you say, okay, you do your thing and I do my thing and we come back. You know that proverb which says, absence makes the heart grow fonder. It is true. If you really want to test a close relationship, I would recommend give space. The same thing applies to children who are growing up. Do you give them that autonomy? Do you give them that thing of keeping away? A child who cries that I want to sleep only with mama. For some time, yes, fine. Slowly you have to wean him off. You have to make him independent. You have to make him autonomous. He may cry. He may get upset. He may say whatever he wants to uh, say. But unless and until you create that space, he will be all the time depending on his mama, not only to sleep with her, but also hundred other ways in which he will be dependent on her. That is not a good relationship, isn't it? So you have to set certain boundaries. Okay, we'll do it this way. We'll do it that way. Sometime you can sleep here. Then slowly we will do that. All these factors have to be taken into account to make sure that you know we have this uh, uh, giving of space and setting of uh, boundaries. You have all heard of this uh, proverb or whatever which people keep saying that this person is my soulmate. I'm very, very ignorant about what is a soul in the first place. I only know SOLE. When I sit and introspect and when this person says, so-and-so is my soulmate, does it mean that you are beyond your bodies, beyond your life? You're so connected to each other that there is no space for anybody else. Are you so attached to one person that you are saying that this person is part of me, he or she is my soulmate? Which means that there is no provision for anybody else to come into the... Uh, that is something which I want you to question. In why soulmate, even when you are uh, young, you know, children have this thing of best friend. Nowadays they call them besties. She is my bestie. He is my bestie. 
it's like a label that you want to put on uh, somebody you feel very proud of it unless you have a bestie you are supposed to be incomplete everybody has to have a bestie why why can't you have four uh, very good friends when it comes to you know things like uh, uh, dressing or food or something i like to share with person a when it comes to something sentimental or emotional i like to you know share with person b when it comes to academics or studies or something i like to share with person c so you see how from each relationship i am getting some benefit but if i exclude everybody and say this person is my bestie this person is my soulmate what am i doing i am including that person in my intimate circle and drawing a line around both of us both are going to be unhappy so time and again time and again i have been continuously watching this thing happening of late after the smartphone era came in one of the things which uh, has become very important in uh, man woman relationships is to check on each other's phone they want to know what whom you spoke to when you spoke what message you uh, gave and the other person gets very angry why do you have to spy on uh, me there are people who go to the extent of you know waiting for the spouse to go into the bathroom and jumping and picking up the phone and checking it out forget that there are people who i have been told pay money to the phone provider airtel or whoever it is and ask them to give uh, them information about their partners uh, calls or messages or whatever uh, it is there are people who spend a fortune to create an app whereby when the partner gets a call it gets recorded on this partner's phone i mean if you have to go to such extents what sort of relationship is it have you questioned yourself on that then you decide how you are going to become a policeman and how you are going to spy and what are you going to learn okay you learn that your partner is doing something which you didn't want to uh, do so what what are you going to do with it this is not a court of law where you can go and uh, present evidence and get some judgment in your favor relationships are never like that uh, uh, isn't it i know of people who get very upset if the spouse says i want to have a separate bank account why we should have a joint bank account what is wrong with it small small things like this i have been noticing over the years so many people who come to me for counseling or who have been sharing with me formally or informally i realize that very often there are people who do not set a few boundaries i want to have a separate bank account for whatever reason i want to have that privilege of saying that i have so much money it may not be a big amount it may not be something great but it gives me a sense of identity that i have a bank account which is exclusively my own and i can deposit money and withdraw money wherever i want from it now these are some of the very very you know basic uh, things let me also tell you why some people cannot you know uh, allow the person that uh, uh, freedom why they keep intruding into the inner circle of somebody whom they apparently care for or whom they uh, love because basically they are insecure they are scared what if this person leaves me and goes away what if my bestie acquires another bestie and starts ignoring uh, me what happens if my soul soulmate you know takes off with soli soul and walks off from uh, uh, me whenever these type of doubts start coming in you start grabbing on and you start intruding and when you find that somebody whom you care for whom you love who is important to you but is intruding into your inner circle i think nipping it in the bud is the best way don't wait till things become very bad and then at some point you say see i'm getting fed up of you you are doing this to me you are 
intruding into my privacy or not giving me space, things can get very unpleasant. So the moment you see these danger signs that somebody very close to you is constantly trying to intrude into your privacy or private space and is not giving you the freedom, please make efforts to ensure that you draw the lines. Okay. I have listed out a few very simple tips and techniques and Anis has made it into a nice little slideshow. I'll show it to you and you can have a look at what are the various ways in which you can prevent somebody you know, intruding into your inner uh, circle, how to set up boundaries. And every close relationship should have boundaries, remember that. Be it your parent, be it your sibling, be it your child, be it anybody, there has to be boundaries. How do we do that is this little checklist which I have made out. The first one, you are thinking about him all the time. Are you allowing him or her to intrude into your boundaries? This is the question that we need to ask. And how you can check whether that is happening or uh, not is given in these you know, seven simple points. Number one, are you thinking about him or her most of the time? Anything that you do, is it being governed by the other person? Will he be angry if I do this? Will she approve if I do that? Will she like if I do this? By doing this, am I you know, keeping away from this person and I am intruding on the time? So if you find that your words, your actions, your interactions with others, your other relationships are all the time being intruded by your thoughts about this particular person, that person has intruded into your inner boundaries. So please push that person out. The next one, if you tend to change your schedule or your interests for the sake of this person. No, I like to do that, but you know, my son doesn't like it. So therefore I decided not to do. I love this, 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 but my mother gets upset if I do it. So therefore I will not do it. To some extent, yes, we have to oblige our near and dear. We have to make changes and we have to realign our schedules so that, you know, we are kind to them. But if this has become a habit, if you are perpetually changing your schedules or your interests or your activities, focused on that one person, if you keep thinking all the time that, you know, this will not be approved, I have to oblige this person, I have to do things which are approved by that person, then only there will be harmony and there will be a good relationship. You are allowing yourself to go deeper and deeper and more into trouble. And then, as I mentioned to you, if anybody close to you, be it a friend, a boyfriend, a wife, a whatever uh, it is, a mother, if that person is either snooping into your phone, checking out of who your friends are and what do they do, going on to social media and finding out what is happening in your life instead of sitting and asking you directly. That means that person is doesn't trust you and the person is trying to intrude into your privacy, which I think we should talk it over and stop it at that time itself. The person wants to know where you are all the time. When did you go there? Whom did you meet? How did you go? and reach there. What did you do after doing that? With whom were you traveling? Whom were you talking to? Who was this uh, phone call that just came for uh, you? The person wants to know where you were all the time, whether it is relevant or irrelevant. I know of spouses who inquire about everything that happens in a spouse's office. Who sits next to you? How much do you talk to that person? When you go to the canteen, who goes with you, you know that something is not okay. The person is becoming jealous or suspicious. And if you keep answering and obliging the person, you will find that he will 
walk all over you. The next, ah, this is a very interesting one. You know how people manipulate close relationships by saying, I love you so much, I cannot live without you. I will lose my temper on you. I will harass you. I will force you to do what I want should be done. I will keep badgering you. I will not give you space. But if you try to move away from me, I will emotionally blackmail you by saying, I cannot live without you. Don't leave me and go away. I will commit suicide. How easily that word is bandied around. But some time or the other, if you want, you can check with me. There's a checklist for suicide risk. I can give that to you and you can check. When somebody threatens, you know, that I can't live without you, I will commit suicide. You just use that checklist to check out how serious it is. In most cases, you will find that it is an absolutely empty threat. Don't get emotionally blackmailed by it. And then the person does not allow you to have any secrets, even if not concerned to him. Let's say there's a husband and wife. And the wife's father is having certain issues. And she knows it. She's trying to help or she's trying to discuss with father or mother or something. Now, that in no way is you know, relevant to the son-in-law. So if she just says, that, you know, my father is going through something and I need to spend more time with him and I'm doing it. And the husband asks, what is going on? And she says, no, it is very personal. It's nothing to do with you or me. It doesn't affect us in any way. But since he's my father and I'm very concerned about him, that's why I'm going to be spending some time and trying to see. But I want to retain his, you know, confidentiality, his secret. I don't want to share it with you. Now, is the husband open to being broad-minded enough to say, yes, it, is, it does not concern me. So why should I, when, whenever my wife is ready and open to discuss with me, she'll do it. Otherwise, let us move on. Let us build our relationship rather than spoiling our relationship, questioning on her relationship with her father and what is happening in his life. And then he criticizes you even when it is not your fault. This is a very, very strong red flag. If it weren't for you, you always do this. You never listen to me. These are typical signs of trying to emotionally blackmail a person to get that person under your control so that you can transcend all the boundaries, the privacy, the confidentiality of that person and thereby try to control. Because once you get to know sometimes even very small, very minor things which the other person has done, this person can use it to emotionally blackmail. Yes, you remember five years back what you had done and that, 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 that. So now this person is supposed to feel embarrassed or guilty because of uh, that. So this is what I want you to understand that there are ways and means if you become aware that I want to do something about it, you can do it. It's not very difficult. It takes a little bit of courage and it takes a little bit of uh, you know motivation. But once you do that, you will find that the relationships not only do not deteriorate in the long run, they actually become better. That's the beauty of it. Give a serious thought to what I told you. And it's time for me to take my one minute tea break. Mira is here to give you some quick little inputs and then I will be back. Yes. Hello, everyone. So uh, we are really, really happy to tell you that we've had our uh, half yearly annual uh, HH volunteer meet. 
wherein uh, you know uh, all of them had come because we have volunteers ranging from 5 weeks to 20, 25 years and they give their unconditional service love time uh, to people who need it and uh, you know they are there for them day night and uh, we feel very happy to meet with them and you know we do some skill building and uh, we uh, you know take them through we ask them uh, what are their um, you know what are their requirements and all that so dr ali and mrs punima ganesh they uh, you know they uh, have this hh volunteer meet and uh, we will very soon also be having the annual meet uh, they dedicate their lives and their unconditional service to the society and they also are few of them are trained counselors and uh, they have a lot of skill which helps uh, people around them now if you feel that yes i also want to you know help or uh, get into volunteering please get in touch with us we are always open to that we are also very happy to say that our uh, you know course in uh, training counselors three batches are almost full uh three batches are full the fourth one is almost getting full so if you feel you want to train to be a counselor if you want to do something for yourself if you want to self develop uh you know if you want to give back to the society then please feel free again to get in touch with us because we'll be very happy to have you with us yes i'm back as i was speaking in the first half i had noticed that uh, satyan my dear friend satyan who's also a very committed volunteer with helping hand he put up the first comment so let me go back to satyan's uh, comment ha huh. he says this is very true however what about if the couple is already away from each other from 8 am until 10 pm at their workplaces and there is not much togetherness this is a absolutely significant and a different angle which satyan has uh, uh, brought up yes i find many people you are talking about a couple being away from 8 am to 10 pm i know of a couple where one spouse does day duty and the other spouse does night duty and they also have a child in between and the child shuttles between the maternal grandparents and the paternal grand parents however much they may need the money however great their jobs may be is this what life is all about so if like satyan said you know you are out from early morning to late in the night what about your work life balance this is something which constantly we have been you know talking uh, about in fact today evening those of you are interested can join us we have our session for our dca students who are just starting off with the new program on work life balance because i want them to be very sure that you should not get into this rat race you as an individual are important your family is important your social life and your recreation is important it is like that woodcutter who kept on chopping trees without realizing that his axe is getting blunt so his efforts were increasing more and more but the result was getting less and less this is what happens in real life yes you may earn little extra money because you are working so hard but there is a limit to it no how do you define that this much money is enough and that much money is not uh, uh, enough people talk for example things like you know education education for children is so expensive so that's why i have to earn i think you're fooling yourself even today good education in some of the schools is available for a very small amount you have to select and you have to find out higher education is available for meritorious students almost free of cost if they win scholarships so much is happening but if i am trying to fool myself by saying that i have to earn more money i have to climb up the ladder and this and that i am doing injustice to myself and i am doing injustice to my you know near and dear and 
like Satya asked, you know, I am going in the reverse direction of spoiling my relationship. One fine day, I'll get up and say that my spouse is a stranger to me. We hardly know each other. And what are we doing? You know, where are we headed in our uh, lives? Okay. Uh, Surekha says, when someone oversteps your boundaries, they are letting you know what you want. Doesn't matter. That's a very, very correct opinion, Surekha. When a person oversteps the boundary. Now, if I know that my family member or my friend does not like this or wants to be alone. But when I intrude and when I say, no, 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 no. How can you say that? I want you. I want you to do this. I want to spend time with you or I want you to take up this activity. What is the signal that I'm giving to that person that I do not value you? And that is one of the very, very strong reasons why if it happens to you, you should start setting the boundaries as fast as possible. I'm not saying that one fine day you cut off and threaten that person and get angry. And do it slowly. Start slowly becoming assertive and start drawing a small line here and there, here and there, till that line becomes so clear that the other person does not get a chance to intrude. Yes, Vinita says, sometimes it's very challenging when few relationships start taking a huge impact on you, both mentally and physically. And it's important for us to set boundaries, yes. And very challenging to counsel youngsters regarding relationship, but we have to just keep doing it. Yes, Vinita, because they live in a different world, no? They are digital natives. You may be a native of Bangalore, I may be a native of Bombay, somebody else may be a native of something. You may be a Kanadiga, somebody is a Tamilian, somebody is a Christian, somebody is whatever uh, faith and community. But most of the youngsters, particularly the modern youngsters of metropolitan cities, they are digital natives. They don't belong to their caste or their community or their birthplace or whatever. So when you are talking to somebody, who is totally different from us, we have to speak their language. That's the only way of getting across to them. Make them talk, listen to them, and then move on. Sujetna says, if son, daughter is doing something wrong, to confirm that and correct them, intruding the boundaries may be required. If we don't do it at the right time, it may lead to irreparable consequences. Yes. I'll give you an example. I know of parents who snoop into their child's phone or their bag or make phone calls to their friends behind their back and ask them what was he doing today or whom he met or what he did. Now that, frankly, I don't approve of. If you feel that your child is doing something by hiding from you and not you know, disclosing to you. First, acknowledge that there is something wrong in my parenting. Why is it that my child wants to do something which is wrong and hide it from me? Because somewhere the child doesn't trust me. Somewhere the communication has broken. So my first step should be to start setting that right. Start having more open talks. Start listening more. Start acknowledging emotions of my uh, child more than the actions of the uh, child. Then the second is, be frank. If you feel that I would like to check your mobile or I would like to speak to your friends and find out things from them, tell them. Initially, he will protest. He'll get very angry with you. But believe me, in the long run, he will respect you because you, he will know that you didn't do anything behind the back. You did not go snooping. You did not tell him lies. Once a parent tells a lie, he says that, did you check on my phone or did you talk to my friends? And the parent says, no, I didn't do it. You have told a lie. You have no moral right remaining to admonish your child when he tells lies. So do it. I'm not saying you should give a free hand to your child, but don't do it behind his back. Be transparent and do it. Surika says, I prefer to say no to what does not align with my values and to say yes to what does. 
boundaries assist me to remain healthy honest and living a life that is true to me 100% right people who live by their basic values will always have their head held up high whether they make big money or not whether people appreciate them or not whether they feel successful in the various ventures or not but they hold their head up high the only word of caution here that i would like to give you is how do you define values if a person says that a boy and girl putting their arms around each other is immoral i don't agree today's generation as i was telling you this you know the digital natives to them putting an arm around each other is the same as like putting an arm around a person of the same gender when we were young nobody stopped us from putting an arm around our boys who were our friends but we were not allowed to touch girls today the scenario is totally different now that is nothing to do with values i'm just giving you this as a caution not particularly to sarika but to all of us that you know sometimes we tend to get, get a little overboard and carried away by what we think are values but sometimes we have to be do a lot of introspection and be convinced that yes this goes against my basic values therefore i am going to take certain steps on that right okay yeah so chetna's uh, um, thing is already there if son, son daughter is doing something wrong to confirm and uh, this thing i would like to add on again to uh, that when uh, you said that you know uh, the son or the daughter is doing something wrong the same way as i mentioned to surekha about values i want you to first with a calm and clear mind stop and think how do i define something wrong please be very clear on the, that in also i will even extend it to say that there are certain wrongs which are not advisable and there are certain wrongs which are not permissible at all let's say you have a child in college who bunks college once in a while and goes and sits in a coffee shop yes it is wrong nobody will deny that but is it so wrong that you have to intrude into the boundary you have to police the child you have to you know go snooping behind him or her and then admonishing the child and making a big issue out of it you have to look at it holistically there are children who say that you know i will do certain things because people don't allow me to do what i want to so keep that in mind surika so says that givers have to set boundaries because takers seldom do you are absolutely right surika there are people who as you rightly defined it's a nice definition takers takers are people who think that the whole world revolves around them everybody should be nice to them everybody should obey what they do tell them to do and everybody should follow the same norms as they do so they want everybody to oblige them and they have nothing to give so what do you do if you happen to be with a taker you automatically become the giver right no you don't have to become the giver you have to as you uh, surekha rightly said set boundaries i will give to some extent i am not a selfish type so i won't say that no no i am right you are wrong i will not contest and make an issue out of it so you want me to oblige here 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 i will uh, do it you are intruding a little bending my boundaries okay i'll tolerate and i'll accept it but you take that one extra step and i'm going to put up my barricades in front of uh, Uh, you this is what we call assertiveness which i have been talking about every now and then this is what we call as balancing your uh, um, life for example we were talking about children and family so far i know a bosses who intrude into the boundaries of their staff they start making personal comments they start questioning 
their you know attitudes or whatever uh, uh, it is they start putting them down in front of uh, others now that is again an area where if you do not feel insecure if you are not scared all the time that what will happen if i say something and the boss gets angry and i lose my job then where will i get another job if you are that insecure of course nobody can help you but if you have a little better self esteem and self confidence believe me being assertive and setting that boundary by telling the person thank you for pointing it out sir but that's my personal issue let's talk about work can you describe to me about what work i have done and how much you approve of it or where you want changes i'm very open to that so it is not very difficult once you get into that habit ha ah, anand is here who says i feel that if we feel something is wrong from our perspective it's better to share our thinking with the child and understand their perspective this helps us very true anand i would only replace the word child with other we can do it with adults also i am interacting with an adult who is important to me who is close to me and i find that something is wrong from my perspective i think the best way of doing it which many people do not do unfortunately is to first sit down and talk to the person ha when you are setting these boundaries no one simple tip if you re recollect i have mentioned this earlier also when you want to tell a person that my perspective is different or i don't agree with you or i feel we should do in a different way please make sure that you are describing the situation in i language not you language you have made this comment you have felt this way you do this you are asking me to do something which i do not agree the more the number of you that you bring into your conversation the more defensive the other person becomes and the more he feels like attacking you if you learn to use the i language i feel that over the years of my experience somehow i am a little convinced that this is the right way i get hurt when somebody is you know, upset with me and says certain things which i feel are true and i feel are correct i want to try out something different i want to have the liberty of being able to present my uh, views i have certain opinions on this which i would like to express and clarify with you you see the difference between the first set of uh, dialogues and the second set of uh, dialogues in the second one you find that people are responding uh, to you much better and then it becomes easier to set the boundary after that you tell the um, uh, person which as i say can be an adult or a uh, child in fact uh, uh, to add to what anand said if i feel there's something wrong from my perspective and it's better to share with the child as he said yes what i also feel is innumerable children do not understand why they are being scolded or punished their memory is so poor about these things they do something and they forget about it so it is up to us to ensure that we clarify with them first before going into the disciplining mode and before setting those boundaries that this is allowed and this is not allowed you cannot say this to me you cannot use that language with me you cannot disobey me all that comes and is much more effective if you start off with uh, you know explaining what happened and what you feel about it ah <laughs> Sudeka says a mother-in-law is a monster in law how does the daughter-in-law coexist even when being assertive have not been effective she does have her way at times but is disturbed by the uneasy undercurrents that are a constant climate in the family yes you know how climate and weather keeps changing in bangalore and in so many other cities but 
first thing I'd like to request you is let us not put labels on people. A mother-in-law is also a mother. A mother-in-law is also somebody's spouse. A mother-in-law is also somebody's daughter. Saas bhi kabhi bahu thi. At some time, she was a daughter-in-law. She was in the exactly opposite uh, situation. Today, she has come to this situation, right? So, let us remove labels. Because somewhere, as uh, Surekha rightly said, no, that the moment you say mother-in-law, you start thinking of monster-in-law. And when you say mother, you say, ah, Mary Ma, so loving, so caring, so nice. But you ask the spouse, and he says, has exactly 180 degrees opposite opinion. He says, my mother-in-law is a monster-in-law, and my mother is my Ma. What a lovely person. So it's a matter of perspective, no? It's a matter of uh, you know dealing with it. Now, in answer to Surekha's uh, uh, question, that if there is a undercurrent, if there is a constant climate in the family, as she said, here is this mother. Let it be anybody, mother-in-law, mother, father, uncle, whoever it may uh, be. There's one person who is part of the family, so you can't get rid of him or her. That person is also maybe senior. So as I started off in the beginning saying that, you know, in our culture and in our traditions, we have to give respect to our elders. We can't speak to them in the same tone as we would be speaking to people who are our age or who are younger than uh, us, right? So we have this person who, as uh, uh, Surekha pointed out, has this habit of creating undercurrents and creating a climate where people are always under tension. People are always tense with what is happening. Can you change the climate or the weather? No. But if you know that you get up in the morning, look out of the window and see a bright sun. And if you happen to be living in a city like Bangalore and various other cities who have similar weather, if you tell yourself, I am not going to be fooled by this sun, bright sun in the morning, by evening when I'm returning home, there may be heavy showers. So I'm going to carry my umbrella and go. So what I was hinting at is, while you cannot change the climate or the weather, you can protect yourself from it. How, how what, there is another long story. It depends on circumstances. It depends on how you handle. But let me tell you, it can be done. And it should be done because it's a lifelong relationship. Ha, ah, here is our friend Saraf Saab all the way from Maharashtra, who is as regular with us every Saturday. Saraf Saab said, living together with each other, this marks the boundaries in relationship. Living separate for some time regains the boundaries. So it's necessary to live apart for a while while staying for a longer period. Yes. This is an extension to what I had said earlier. Even if you cannot live away from each other, take a vacation from each other. Get away at least for some uh, time. I had a friend who had a house which was overlooking a small open ground. And on the other side, there was another house and there was a very pretty girl there. He started ogling at that girl and finally fell in love with her and finally got married to her. Now, his greatest lament is that even when my wife goes to her parents' house, from there she can keep an eye on where I am and what am I doing and what's happening. Why your drawing room light was open till 11.30 in the night? What were you uh, doing? Why did you come back so late yesterday? I saw your vehicle coming in at 1 o'clock in the night. So even when she goes to her parents' house, I have no privacy. See how we are intruding into each other's uh, boundaries? Right. Shilpa says, what if a person who is very close to me crosses the boundary by saying something which is, uh, you know, saying, saying that it is just for fun and apologize later after I express that they have crossed the limit. They get angry with me because I took, uh, you know, took him uh, wrong and make me feel guilty. Yes, uh, Shilpa, I want to, you know, caution all of us that there are people who manipulate in such a way that they want to make you feel guilty. But feeling guilty or not, 
like any other emotion is in your control. So sit down, introspect. First time you get taken in by this person. Second time you get taken in by that uh, um, person. Third time you tell yourself, sorry. I am very clear. If necessary, I'll talk it over with a trusted person or a counselor or somebody to ensure that I am not doing something wrong. I need not feel bad about myself, etc. And take a conscious decision that I'm not going to feel guilty. I am going to stand my ground. I may not be able to win over the other person. It doesn't matter. But at least I'm not going to feel guilty. Sunita says, I've seen very amicable relationships in my daddy's uh, uh, home. Yes, Sunita, what an era it was even two generations back when they, we had all the daddies and nannies and so aunties and uncles and all that. Yes, they also used to fight. They also used to have their problems. I'm not denying it. But what happened, used to happen is that if you have a bad relationship with one person, you would always lean on somebody else and you could balance it out. In nuclear families, you do not get that uh, opportunity. Surika says, how can we encourage those who abuse boundaries? That is, live and let live is a recipe for peaceful coexistence. Yes, it is. But despite the fact, as Surika rightly said, there are some people who abuse uh, uh, boundaries. So when you know that you have a neighboring country who every now and then is poking into the, what do we call it, LOC or whatever it is, first time you get you know, taken in, second time you get taken in, after that, what do you do? You start preparing your defenses, right? And that's what we need to do. Sit down and think, don't do firefighting at that moment when it is happening to you. When things are calm and quiet, right now there's no crisis, that person is not disturbing you in any way. That is the time you sit down and think. See, this is a pattern with this person. The person keeps intruding into my boundary all the uh, uh, time. So next time it happens, what is it that I can do? Let me prepare right now. If necessary, even rehearse it with some very difficult people, you know, get very aggressive and very dominating and suddenly you get shaken up. One good way to prepare how to face them is to rehearse it. Get a friend or a trusted person and say, okay, you behave like that, you know, aggressive person and I will re reply back uh, uh, to you. Let me have a rehearsal of how I am going to respond when this uh, thing uh, happens. We can do it. The problem is many of the, these issues when they come, we only do firefighting. When I have this mother-in-law who has crossed her boundary and giving me trouble, when I have this boss who has become very nasty with me and now I'm feeling it is intolerable. When I have this child who has become very, very naughty and obstinate and arrogant with me, then I wake up. A stitch in time saves nine. Become aware. The whole purpose of these Saturday webinars is to create that little awareness. Now, if you are one of those fortunate people who do, does not have boundary problems, your relationships are going very smooth, you have no issue of anybody intruding into your boundary, and you don't have a habit of intruding into anybody's boundary. Still use today's pointers as a means to prepare yourself in case that uh, happens. Sonal says, very true, and I thank you for uh, saying that. And as we come to the end of the hour, as you know, we try to stick 100% to our timing. We start on the dot of 11 and we end on the dot of 12. And I would like to leave you with the message of next month's, uh, I'm sorry, next Saturday's uh, uh, topic, which is equally interesting, which if you have the time and inclination, I would like you to join me. And more than just joining and logging in, I would like you to give your comments. I would like you to tell what you feel about it or clarify doubts. That's the whole idea of making this uh, session into an interactive. And that's why I sharp at 1130, I stop. And then we have an open house. That's the beauty of the um, uh, thing. And the topic is, can you survive without competing? You don't necessarily have to compete. You can still survive. How do you do that? Because a lot of people will tell you, 
it's a competitive world. You have to compete. You have to be the best. You have to move beyond others and all that. I don't agree. But how and why? Let me talk to you about it next Saturday at 11 o'clock. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye.